Welcome to Come and Reason. I'm delighted you all are here. Thank you for, and I hope you will participate greatly today. Our lesson today is the third lesson in the second quarter's The Great Controversy Sabbath School lesson, which is called Light Shines in the Darkness. Let's pray. Dear Father, we are no strangers to darkness. We were born in darkness. We fight darkness our entire lives. And when we allow you into our hearts, we are able to expel darkness out of our lives and put light there. Today, while we talk about this concept and how it really works in our lives and what we can do when light is shining out of us, please fill us with your Holy Spirit and show us what you want us to know today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Tim Jennings is gone today, so I'm Linda Ojala, and I'm filling in, and I appreciate all of you participating. Is there a speaker on? Is the speaker on? It's I can speak louder if I need to. I can hear you, but... Okay. <laughs> so let's look at the memory text on the first page. It says, Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. John 12, 35. When I was in high school... We were studying Helen Keller, blind and deaf, couldn't relate to the outside world, spoiled brat. I just happened to cross a little, you know, uh, movie vignette about that period of time when Annie Sullivan came to this apparently wealthy person's home and then had to deal with, these, with Helen Keller and how persistently and patiently she tried to work with her to get her to understand there's meaning to your outside world <laughs> and to make her behave. So the teacher said, if you go a day blindfolded, I'll give you extra credit. So, hey, who doesn't like extra credit? I went through the day blindfolded. Has any of you gone through a day blindfolded no. or unable to see? Wow. I highly recommend it <laughs> <laughs> because my whole paradigm shifted when I was without light. <laughs> Things you don't even think of, like, what's on my plate? Is there anything on my fork? Is it a combination of this and that? Or is it just one item? How do I know when my food's gone? When I pick up a, a glass to drink, where do I put it again? Every kind of thing you can't think of. How do you match your clothes? You can't drive, you can't read can't see, you can't appreciate the nature of people's faces that you know and care about. Art, you miss out on all of that. How about keeping soup on a spoon? You ever try to do that blindfolded? Where is the soup to begin with? Is it soup? How much is there? How do I get it here to there without spilling it? There's so much. You can't imagine how much it affects you unless you do a day without sight. And again, I highly recommend it. My whole paradigm shifted that day. So when I read in the Bible about this blind man calling out to Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? He said, I want to see. I understood the I want to see. So I think daily, our spiritual prayer needs to be, I want to see. I want to see what you have in store for me today. I want to see what you want me to do today. I want to see what new truths come down towards me. The Bible says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. In Psalms 107, 119, 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. You've ever imagined, I know most of us here probably are Christians, have read the Bible most of our lives. Have you ever wondered what your life would be like without that? No. I mean, I think of it some, somehow like you're on the ocean with, without a rudder, without a sail. You're just drifting, you know. And somehow, coming, people will think that Christianity is like a crutch for people, but I think it's a strength. It's a strength that the, the bullets can hit you. You can 
cure from that and not pass it on to other people. Because all we, we get injured all through our lives through people who are not healed, who have been injured, and then they turn around and keep on injuring everybody else around them for their entire lives unless they get healed. And I think probably most of us have been badly affected one way or the other by an unhealed person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, Linda. Yes, I Brenda. I studied the, that verse that you, that you wrote, I mean, that you uh, quoted about uh, a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. And the equal to the lamp into my feet was a guide for my present the steps I'm immediately taken. And his word is also a light to my path, a guide for my immediate future. And I thought, I didn't know there was a difference. Well, I look at it this way. I, we don't, our past is only good for learning from. Yeah. We can't change a thing about it, but only we can learn from it and hopefully not mis repeat the same mistakes or learn to put boundaries where boundaries need to be, <laughs> or et cetera. We also don't have the future. So one of my favorite saying is, plan like you're going to live forever, but live like you're going to die today, because you might. And so I think we either sometimes will live too much in the past, ruminating over all the bad things that have happened, or we live in the future, hoping, wishing. That day, when that happens, I'll be happy. When that event happens, I'll be thrilled. We only actually have today, you know. Today, every day, one day at a time. <laughs> we only have today and what can we make of it. So I think your uh, example there in your Bible is right. Today is what we need to follow. Day by day, Jesus went to God. What do I do today? What's my mission for today? Really, that's what we should be doing. When you think of the present... This is the present. Mm -hmm. It's a gift. That too. Yeah. You know, a present is a gift. And I, you know, for years just have heard that, but never connected it with a gift. It's a gift to us. Yes, it is. Also, Linda, the lamp is a device for giving light. And light is a natural agent that stimulates sight and makes things visible. So... I really studied that. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. You know, I was thinking, our eyes are naturally drawn to light. I don't know, sparkling on the water, mm -hmm. dew on the grass, or on a spider web. I don't know about you, but I'll see these amazing things in nature that are sparkling and colorful. And I, I just have to stop and think, that is beautiful. No diamond in the world is as pretty as that. You know, wh what is But we're drawn to light. But... Our hearts are drawn to darkness. It's hard to imagine. We, we tend to suck away into the part of darkness because we were born in darkness. But our eyes are drawn to the light. So we have to learn to follow the light away from the darkness. Let's, so, yes? We need to understand also that there are two, there are two beings who claim to be light bearers. There, there's, a, there's a false light and, a, and, a, and an actual light. Uh, Luz, the, name, literal name, the name Lucifer means literally light bearer. Sure. And he promised Eve in the garden that the fruit was useful for obtaining knowledge. Mm -hmm. Light, for, for enlightening her. And, and that's part of why she ate the fruit and then mm -hmm. gave some to her husband. Um, <clears throat> so there, we are called to contrast the two beings... One Michael, the whom we know, the being we know is Jesus of Nazareth, and Lucifer, the being we know is Satan. Both of them are promising light. What's the difference? How do we flesh out the difference between the light that, in, that leads to darkness and the light that leads to eternal life? Any ideas? Well, when I when I think of that, I look at the light that Satan brings is always bad. It's not like when <coughs> Job went to Job, he could have blessed Job, given him wonderful things, but he wanted him to die. He took that away from him. And when we look at the light that Christ has, there's happiness. There's, you know, a future to look forward to. But with, with Satan, there's nothing. I mean, when you think, if we didn't have the Bible, we wouldn't know mm -hmm. that there was sin and truth. How would we know? Yeah, we'd be blindsided. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we, we would have 
we would have some testable laws still, even without Scripture. We would have testable laws uh, that we can see in creation, uh, that we can see working throughout all that God has made, because, and actually Scripture tells us that in Romans, that, mm-hmm. that everything that can be known about, what, uh, about God, it can be seen in what has been made, so the men are without excuse. The Bible is an extra, is icing on the cake. It's, it's helpful, but it's not, it's not the only thing, it's not the only thing necessary. But if we didn't have the Bible, how would we know who created the world? I mean, there's things in nature, yeah, but we, we know that because we know God created the world. We, we would still be able to see God's handiwork. We would still be able to see yeah, that the complexity and the it, design. But, so how would we know it's God's handiwork? <clears throat> We could we could be able to differentiate between we may not know the being as as God the God that we know but we would know that an, an intelligence greater than humanity greater that a being greater than the a creative being <coughs> designed the system and designed giving and the law of giving into the system because we can see the law of giving into the system we can see law of beauty we can see truth. We can see all sorts of things in, in the system of creation, even though it's been affected with the, the uh, antithe- antithesis of, of uh, giving. We can, still, we can still be able to flesh it out. Uh, Romans says that those who know not what's in the law but do the things according to the law are law in and the, of and themselves. Those who don't have access to Scripture, still they can still flesh out and discover God's design laws by just simply by observing nature. I read one time that <laughs> that there there is a tribe in South America that uh, worshipped birds of every kind, you know, and they had to stop and do something with each bird that they came across that was holy. And so many birds were holy, they were having a hard time getting anything done because they were always coming across one bird or another, or another, or another and having to do some act of worship for each bird. So it was a relief when Christianity came to them because they, could, they didn't have to stop worshiping the birds all the time. Which, uh, yeah, I, I agree that you can flesh it out, but also there's many religions that take nature and nature alone and go wrong with it. Absolutely. Yeah. You can go off so I wrong agree with nature. both of you that nature helps us to feel the right and wrong, see it. And, and what could you come up with? I mean, in the end, there's only two groups, right? No matter how many Christian religions there are, no matter how many non-Christian religions are, for the people of the world, no matter what you believe, there's only two groups at the end. So what is a fair way to look at all of these people who grew up with being given various beliefs by their families and their culture and so on? What is a way that you could you know, distinguish the sheep from the goats. I'm not sure that's our job. But I think what, what I'm getting at is that we look down on a lot of other people in a lot of other religions and so on, sometimes thinking, poor them, you know, they don't have the light. <laughs> and yet there'll be only two groups at the end. So how do all of these people get the light? You know, if they're fed misinformation. They're, they're good people. You can see people who are, have been good, kind all their life, but they may not go to the same church you go to. And so I do maybe believe that uh, they know the Lord maybe in a different way than we do. But they're good people. They haven't gone out and done any of the bad things. So I think God will save them too. I don't think our salvation has anything to do with what church we go to. No, how no, well we no absolutely not. Yeah. I agree with Art, you were going to say yeah. something? I think one of the things that God looks for is our teachability. Mm-hmm. Uh, are we willing to listen? Our reception. And there's a lot of people mm-hmm. who may not have all the facts. They may not know the seven seals. They may not know about the trumpets. Jesus himself. But they're teachable. They're willing to listen. <clears throat> and that's one of the things that God looks at. And also, if their heart is, is longing for something, the Holy Spirit's going to reach out to them. Amen. I mean, we might not have to preach to them, but the Holy Spirit's going to reach out to them. I watched this thing one time. It was called Living with the Come-By. 
And it was two British guys who went in and lived with a group of, un, I mean, natives in, in New Guinea or something. And they hadn't really been contacted by people from the outside. So the whole show was, how do these people live? And, they, and it was really interesting. How, they're people who build houses way up in the top of trees. <laughs> And so they learned that there's a Home Depot out there in the forest. <laughs> People knew exactly what to use for this and that and the other thing. But the most interesting thing was the chief's wife welcomed them in and let them stay in their own building, so to speak, and then finally uh, built a house for them. I mean, she was very, she called them her sons. You know, she welcomed these outsiders. Um, I think the outsiders didn't recognize what was being said about them. They stink. <laughs> their hands look like they've never had done a day's work in their life. Because obviously the people in the tribe had very tough hands for using their hands all the time. But I recognized here in this village, it made me hone in on that woman who was willing to house these stinky strangers. <laughs> you know, uh, in Europe a lot of times they don't believe in, in deodorant. And so there, there can be a real stench, you know. And these, these, while these people were noticing all these things about the newcomers, she was so welcoming, so uh, hospitable. And I thought, they are blessed because they went to a different village to talk to somebody and they were met with a guy with an arrow pointed right toward them. And so way back in there, in the, in the jungles or so on, there are people who are hospitable, caring, accepting, welcoming, and so on. So I think you're right that God's spirit can be in a person if they are welcoming that, if they, if they welcome that kind of yeah. life. Mm -hmm. But I also agree that the Bible adds a, a texture, a layer to that understanding. It gives the, it gives the rudder, it gives the sails, the direction so that you can end up where you want to go. Because one of the things I advise um, younger people who are in college age and so on, you know, or even older people who are thinking about their direction in life, before you start climbing a ladder that you've put up against a building, make sure it's the right building. You know, because you can climb and be very industrious and then you get up there and you think, well, I'm in the wrong place entirely. All that effort. So scope out where your direction is your result before you start climbing a ladder of any belief. I, Tim has mentioned this, and it really was one of the, the things that struck me when I first started coming to the Sabbath school, was the story about the uh, person being in a cave, dark cave, lost, trapped in there for a week, two weeks, whatever. And somebody, if somebody comes and rescues them and brings them out at midnight, there's not a problem. Nice and dark. It was dark there. It's dark here. But what if he is rescued and brought out at noon after having been in the complete darkness for a week or two? It would be very painful. So I vote that we allow the Holy Spirit in to confront our issues now, every day, while it's today, and not wait till the end when all of the issues will be exposed. If you come out at noonday when the ruler of the universe is there... <laughs> You can't hide. You, no rationalization is going to help you. No amount of trying to hide the truth or denying the truth. The truth will be out there. And all the ripple effects from everything that you did to hurt yourself and others and your relationships and so on. I think it's a, a I think of that in my mind as a way of, of encouraging me to go to God every single day and let the, the, his light rise with healing in its wings, or its rays, as the Bible says, rather than the full-on blast of noonday at the, when Jesus comes to take his people. So I've, I uh, highly recommend that we, if we haven't been doing daily prayers, or Bible searches and so on, that we should. We need to let the Holy Spirit in. Why? What do you feel like the Holy Spirit does to you when you let him in? He enlightens us as we read the word. He brings things into our heart and mind. I've experienced it many times, and a lot of it isn't good. And, but yet, 
he gives the grace to be able to handle what he's showing me and with conviction there comes power to not be overwhelmed by it but love he's only showing me this in love he also protects us from making wrong choices yeah mm -hmm. so ken and i've been reading the bible together and we've been you know getting personal while we're reading the bible talking about personal things issues and so on and we say you know this is not fun <laughs> not fun um at all but why on earth would you read the bible just as a history book yeah which a lot of people do well what a nice story i've read that story there's jonah there's you know all the stories we're real familiar with but each time we come to the Bible with an open heart and with the Holy Spirit showing us spotlight on whatever we need to work on today, um, we need to face that, face that difficulty, face the issue, deal with the issue. Do you think that's why a lot of people don't read their Bibles? Yeah, probably. They don't want to face what's being said, because for me, I've... I've read the Bible back and forth so many, I don't know how many times because I just read it and then I go back and read it again. Every time it acts like a whole new book to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever found it where you, mm -hmm. you know you've, you've read this same Bible repeatedly and that you've never read. <laughs> but there it is, still in the same Bible. You know you've read it, but all of a sudden it stabs you. <laughs> you know, this is what you need to know for today. When the, when the Bible says it's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, I think scalpel <laughs> in surgery. Not, it's not a fun procedure, but it's what is necessary to cut out the evil in our hearts. Sunny. I think it's a comfort, though, depending on your state, what you're going through in your life. Yes. It's a definitely a comfort and um, a guide and um, just um, yes. knows that, you're, that someone's mm -hmm. there that loves you and that is mm -hmm. guiding you, especially if you're alone. Mm -hmm. in life and uh, depends on the stage of life you're in if you're looking at if you if the Holy Spirit has convicted you of something that you didn't do exactly right well then yeah you you feel that t uh, that pressure but it, it depends on what you're going through yeah Brenda. and also Linda that it's to like she says to lavish his love on us because there are days I just need to be lavished, you know? Mm -hmm. And he knows when I can't handle some new light about myself. He knows that. And he'll lavish me with his love. And then when, when I'm okay, and only he knows at that point, he will reveal, you know, more light. So I have this mental picture. A lot of times I think in mental pictures because it helps me to visualize the process rather than just a step list of things to do it's more like a scenario of things so when I think of the Christian life I think of a big cross sturdily stuck to a rock in the middle of a raging river <laughs> and we are hanging on to that cross like some people hang on to trees and th floods and all that kind of thing for dear life we're hanging on to the cross for dear life and you have to hang, in order to stay in the raging river on that cross, you have to hold it with both hands. This year has been a, a, tif a very difficult year for me. I've learned a lot about myself that I didn't like. I've, learned, I've worked through a lot of issues, forgiveness and uh, understanding, compassion. Various things have been, a, it's been a very difficult year. And the temptation is to hold on to that. Somebody hurt me. Somebody betrayed me. Somebody whatever. I, uh, I lost, you know, that was important to me. And it dawned on me one day that I'm, when I was studying that if you try to hang on to this cross in the raging water for one, with one arm, you're never going to stay there. You have to be willing to let the water take away the things that you hold on to, the injuries, the resentments, the bitterness, the, the lack of forgiveness, the pride. <coughs> Whatever is you're hanging on to here is not going to work getting to heaven. <laughs> it's not helping you 
And you have to be willing to just let it go. I, I envision letting, watching this stuff, put it in the water, wash it. The Lord washes it away and I can hang on with two hands in the help of the Holy Spirit. But if we try to hold on to all the bad things that happened in our life, that's, that's one hand too few. <laughs> you, you've got to hold on to Christ with both hands. And if you don't, if you think that you can hold on and still keep all of this stuff, you're, you're mistaken. Well, also, Linda, in letting go of the stuff, it's not to keep our eyes on the stuff, but to look up and behold the Lamb, because He's the, he's the one that's going to have to do the getting rid of in the first place. And so what is it? what do you get in return for that? Peace. 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 I hear peace. Peace. Freedom, too. Because Freedom. It Freedom. Advantage. Hmm? Yes. Wasn't it a weight? Wasn't it a baggage to, to get the freedom and relief? Yeah. So we held on to our grievances uh, because we're afraid, I think, that people, if they get away with what they've done to us, yeah. that they won't learn anything and they'll just hurt us again and uh, they, they, you know, they'll just get away with it. And so um, we want to hold people accountable, you know, for what they've done. But is it our job to hold them accountable? And do they ever really get away with it? No. Do they ever get away with it, said he said. Damages them too. They don't get away with it. And who is better equipped to deal with it? When the Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Why is that important to allow? Is it because God cares for their salvation? Well, you mean like you just want them to get stricken back you want to you want to pay them back or something who have done terrible things to you but God wants them to be saved so he says let it leave it to me I'm better at it than you are but it's hard to realize that God's better at something than you are we're so full of ourselves and we think we have the handle on everything but he has an immense toolbox of ways of fixing things and sorting through things and disciplining people. Look in the Old Testament how God disciplined the Israelites. And then they would go wrong and he'd discipline them again. And he'd, the disciplines kept getting bigger and bigger. And you'll notice that, I think. And if you really look in your life, you'll notice that, you know, you're faced with something, you fail. You're faced with it, something similar, only a little worse, you fail. Think of Pharaoh in Egypt. Every plague was a little bit worse than the plague before until it was the final plague of the death of the firstborn son. What if Pharaoh had decided to let him go with plague number one? <laughs> Egypt would not have been decimated. Egypt was absolutely decimated. His, his Pharaoh's counselors were saying, please, let him go. Let them go. <laughs> Don't you realize the whole country is messed up? The whole country is lost because of all these plagues and your stubbornness? So, I have a, an observation to make that um, one, of the, one of the most um, impactful stories I ever heard was about this guy, and I think his name was John Krakauer, who had gone up to Mount Everest. And um, a lot of people die up there because they get stuck in these, in these storms, these squalls, whatever, that you know, and they either can't find their way out or they get stuck or they, and they, they lose energy. Um, and when you get that cold, the tendency is to take a little rest. You know, close your eyes. You'll wake up and things will be better. But the fact is that without the light, this guy said he was so cold that it was, it was just unbelievable, and he said, unless I had opened my eyes and the energy of the light came in, I would have perished that day. Wow. And, wow. and you know, you, you see these things on TV or whatever, you know, where somebody's losing their life energy, their life vital energy, and so on, and somebody's shaking them and saying, stay with me, stay yeah, with stay, me, you know. Yeah. And, Unless you, 
unless you respond to that energy that comes from God through the light, I mean literal light, as well as the spiritual light, you're going you're gonna to close up, you're going to shut down, and someone else, some the, the, the deceptive light bearer, is going to take control of your heart and of your, and of your life. Mm -hmm. wow. And you may not have it anymore, as far as that goes. So I think we have a problem sometimes with thinking, well, I've studied the Bible and I prayed like a couple of days ago, so that should be holding me, <laughs> you know. But if you went without actual food for that length of time, would you feel the same way? You'd be like starving, you know. We need to be starving for the, for the, the Scripture. We need to be uh, not realizing that just like a person swimming upstream or a salmon or whatever, as long as you're swimming upstream, you're going, you know, you have the energy and you're going up against the current. But the minute you stop, do you stay in the same place as you were? No, the minute you stop swimming, you're going with the, the tide backwards, you know, I mean, the, with the current backwards down the stream. I think, it's a, I think this is one of the many deceptions that Satan uses to try to get us to think, well, we have a good relationship with God and a few days here, you know, not communicating with God very much is, is okay. We're, we're good. We were good a few days ago. So we're still good now. But in actuality, we're further downstream or... <laughs> I was blind as a bat when I was a child, and I had to go out in the ocean. And uh, you'd play in the ocean. You didn't realize the current was working your way down the ocean. <laughs> and then I'd look up in my blindness and try to figure out, where is my blanket? I have no idea where I am. I didn't realize that during the play, I had gotten way down the beach. So then I realized that I should keep looking at the building shapes behind where my blanket was, I should keep honing in on that over and over again so that if I was drifting, I would come back. And I would say that's one thing I would encourage us all to do because it's really easy for Bible time, prayer, just listening to God, not just talking to him like some kind of a vending machine, give me this, do that, do the other thing, directing him around, but really listening to how you can fit into his perspective. His way of doing it, what he needs for you to do the way. That's like Jesus did every day. Went and found out what his father's plan was for the day. I want to talk a little bit about our God is a consuming fire. We've hit that quite a number of times in class. But there is a text that says in Isaiah uh, 9.17 that wickedness burns like a fire. And so when it's the end of time, if you've kept hold on to wickedness, I imagine that our circuits could not take the amount of energy and the amount of thought and truth coming to you all at once. Um, A description that Tim in, in a conversation uh, once gave, and it was, it'll seem out of context, but, but there's a reason for the, the comment. And it was in discussion about narcissistic personalities and how if you, if you should mention something that seems objectively, evidently true, there can be a harsh snap uh, at the individual, and, uh, and it seems out of disproportion, and where did that come from and all the rest? And the description was this, imagine you're in a manor, lovely English manor, been invited over, and the, the regal manor, uh, lord of the manor, is the one that invited over. And as you go in, you notice that where there would typically be mirrors, that there are these painted pictures of this regal, you know, duke or whatever, that, that looks grand. But when you actually meet the person they come out, they don't look like that. They've got sores that are draining and oozing. They're just uh, in, in a pretty wretched condition. If in your well-meaning, which would have been me, um, if you're in your well-meaning state, you would notice, oh, apparently this mirror has an issue, let me just clean that off for them. Would they appreciate that? No. Because now when they pass the mirror, they actually see what is versus what they have as their perception and want to maintain as their perception of truth 
But it's not really truth. It's the way they want people to see them, the way they want to see themselves, right? So similarly, as so many that we encounter, how each one of us, there are things that we want to believe because the light of truth, there's so much pain in the world. There's so much pain individuals have experienced. And that pain just keeps on going, right? The ricochet of pain. And that as one person is hurting, that pain is then passed on. You snap at someone else, they wonder what they did. It wasn't them, it was something else. That ripple of pain is just horrific, okay? So same way that that embracing truth like you were talking about, as it comes, also being willing to listen to truth as it comes and seeking the light of truth that you've already pointed out. When you started and you were talking about what differentiates then how we're going to know the light of truth, as um, Tim was talking on the first week of this quarter, the fear, right? So in the garden, it was fear. They went and hid. Whenever the focus is on the externals, the Ten Commandments, it's fear. Am I doing the right things? The light of our focus is on us. What are we doing? It's completely missing the source of healing and power. If our spotlight of light is focused on us, then we're in the wrong focus. Shift that focus to the Heavenly Father. If our spotlights are on the Heavenly Father of, oh, what an amazing yes. God, then that light of truth gets to be, oh, thanks, I didn't know that was there. Pausing and having that time together, letting that light shine in and understand that the hurts that we had, as he's described before, what hell has that other person gone through to be so broken that they've got that much pain that they're emitting? And would you want to trade places with them once you understand that? Oh, no, I think I'll keep my own, thank you. Um, and that's but, an important part of forgiveness, is realizing and, they are wounded people who can't help but hurting you. And it allows... <laughs> to truly approach life as if everyone's doing their best, even though we, we know that not everyone is, but if we approach it as if they are, because we have no idea what their struggles are or past, it can allow God's grace to come in and shine through. So when you were talking about that light at the beginning of the lesson, that, that light, the light that brings that focus on love of God, that grace and compassion versus the fear aspect. And so that the, the law of love to God, the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself, that focus of love versus the legal side of are you doing the ten and are you perfect and not committing any of the ten, we've lost the, the focus on the source of power. And I remember Tim saying once along that same lines that the Ten Commandments are kind of like a sign outside of a hospital that says, when you leave here, you won't be coughing, you won't have a fever, you won't be spitting up stuff, nasty greenness, you won't be, all of this stuff will be gone because you'll be healed. So the Ten Commandments, like an MRI or something, show us what's wrong. They don't fix us, they just show us something's wrong. And then if we have the courage, we should be praying something along the lines of show me who I really am and give me the courage to turn to you when you do because he always answers that prayer and it's never fun uh, but it's necessary because we, we are blinded to ourselves and then I'll turn that around and we are also on, one, on the other hand so interested in our own salvation that we are not compassionate enough about the salvation of others our salvation can become selfish. If you can think of, I want to get to heaven. Me, me, me getting to heaven. You, Moss, find the flame for your own. You know, I'll throw a tidbit to you every now and then, but I'm making it. Good luck to all you. And yet, we are. <laughs> we, we can, I, I, when that thought was first introduced to me, I think Karen Covey is the one that first introduced the thought to me that selfishness, I mean, your salvation could be selfishness when you're only thinking about your own salvation. <laughs> what about all these people? In Proverbs 24, it says, rescue the perishing, those staggering towards destruction. 
And when you look around at people with all their burdens and so on, staggering towards destruction, do you have, do we have compassion on them? Or we just hope they'll find their way or we do some nice little thing? Or do we really lay it out there and try our best to help them find the way to healing and salvation? Or do we mostly care about our own salvation? And I don't know, that was the first time I'd ever thought about selfish salvation. You know, because it's, I got to be saved. You got to do this to be saved. Well, what about that guy? He's, I'm not my brother's keeper. Let him find the path. I'll maybe throw a thing to him or maybe hopefully he'll take it up and go. But I think the thing that separates all of us, no matter what religion we are, no matter what culture we live in, no matter what the religion is, the thing that separates is compassion for other people. Love and care for other people. You'll notice that um, in the verses in the Bible that talk about the, the last day, the people who are saved, the sheep, the goats, people who aren't, one of them talks about, well, when you gave a cup of water to the least of these, you gave it to me. When, when I was in prison, you visited me, and so on and so forth. It's, it's rubber meets the road stuff. Anybody can do that, no matter what your religion is or not. When you did it to me, you did it to the least. What about giving a little um, a cup of water to a child? What cha about changing a diaper of a child? You know, what about all the things that you have to do to, uh, to the least of these to help them survive and live? And mothers will struggle with all the stuff they have to do and not realize that it's, that's doing it to Christ. Even, you know, who are the least of these? Their little children, even maybe pets, and so on and so forth. I'd like to ask a question, uh, throw it out there to all of you. What influenced your spiritual and religious uh, choices? Because we're talking about choices and others' choices, but the kinds of things that affected you may also be the kinds of things that affected other people and things we can uh, utilize for that. Can I ask you one question on the, the, the prior topic before this question? And that was when you were talking about that, that salvation can be selfish. It struck me suddenly that being able, that, that simple litmus of just reflecting and asking oneself, what's behind this? If it's the, I got to be saved, I got to be saved, what's behind this? I'm hearing fear of being lost. So what's behind it is fear. I'm afraid I will be lost. Or won't measure up. I'm afraid I won't measure up. Yeah. Versus the love of God, the God of love that, that is drawing us to him, the God of love that wants us to be there with him. That he's not standing there at the door with a dress code, you know, uh, a checklist and you're out if you're not. He wants us there with him. So if it's love drawing as a, that magnetism and the truth sets you free, that's an easy litmus test. Is this the motive behind? Oh, okay, that seems more, more directed to true north, right? But if it's fear, if it's fear of not getting there, if it's fear of my own fallibility, if it's fear of, then that's pulling me off course because now again, the spotlight of the attention goes to self and just trying to elbow oneself to the front of the crowd to get there. Well, like Adam and Eve, first thing they did, hide behind the trees. Yeah. I would guesstimate that there are many, many, many people still hiding behind the trees, yeah. <laughs> afraid of God, afraid of the outcome. Your very best, will it be good enough? And yet it's his very best that'll be good enough. And so while we can't you know, Ellen White says there can't be one thread of selfishness if you're to be saved. <laughs> one thread. So it reminds me of a little hummingbird I found one time that was stuck in a spider's web on a walk I was on. I picked it up and it had spider webs on it. I had no idea at the time that hummingbirds use spider webs to make their nest, to help secure their nest. But what is that spider web? What is that little hummingbird doing down in the spider web? So I had it in my hand, and I was picking the spider webs off, and, I, and then I let my, when I thought I had them all, I opened my hand, and it tried to fly, but it couldn't because there was one web left that I had missed. So when I was able to pull that last web off, off it flew. 
one thread kept it from flying, you know? And yet we cannot push selfishness out of our hearts. I don't know how many of you have read um, Ellen White's statements of, you know, just take my heart. <laughs> it's your own. You know, do with it what needs to be done because I have no ability to do that whatsoever. I can only choose you and let you in. That yeah. God is a gentleman. He will wait, knock and wait till you and you invite him in. But Satan is no gentleman. If he finds a little creek, you know, a crack in your uh, spiritual armor or something he tempts you to do, he's more than happy to just zip right in there without your request. <laughs> And very hard to get out in some cases, almost impossible. So, thank you. That was a good insight, and I really appreciate that. Uh, I want to. So, I want to go back to um, how to influence others for Christ, for following this light, uh, by examining how, what happened to us. Would anybody like to share? A little, just a little bit about what drew you to Christ to begin with uh, or drew you to Adventism specifically or drew you to come in reason even more specifically? Well, what drew me to come in reason was the things that Tim brought out that I'd never heard before. And I've been an Adventist my whole life, been faithful. But he came up with things that I'm like, how is that true whenever our church has never taught that? But then when you go home and research it, you do see it, see it as the truth the way he told it. So hearing the truth about God is what brought me to come to reason. Brenda? It was my desperate need because <coughs> I was, you know, coming from abuse since childhood. Um, I went through a lot of years of pain and caused my daughter a lot of pain and that rippling. <laughs> and it was only until I looked at Jesus and started reading his word, that's all I did, was I just realized my need and I didn't have anybody to guide me. And I just read. And then when Tara was converted seven years ago, and she had this, like, it's been years since the ongoing relationship with Jesus, but when she was converted and had that, that fire in her, that love for God, I wanted that even deeper. So I upped my time with Jesus. I want that. I want some of that. <laughs> and so I've been doing that ever since. And peace. Amen. I mean, and even though we may stray, he always brings us back in love. And I'm not talking about major strays. I'm talking about little things that can keep you away from Jesus. But he always brings us back in love. And Have you um, ever had the, the feeling that he's coming after you? <laughs> he's pursuing you. He really wants to be your friend. He doesn't want to let you go. He doesn't want to see you drift off. So I think of a parent, you know, a child falls overboard and the child, you say, come here, come here, I'm in the boat and reaching out for a child. And the child goes, no, <laughs> you know, every time you try to give them something to hold on to, like, no, get away, no, get away, you know, and you keep reaching and you keep reaching and finally they sink and you have to have the, the uh, awful result of seeing your child die for their own choices that they wouldn't accept the truth, and they wouldn't hold on to the end. It, it's, you know, it's hard to understand sometimes for me that God loves us all, no matter how bad we are and so on. But it must be a very strange thing for God at the end to have to, to see so many of his children not, um, not holding on to his hand, not pulling them out. I have an answer as well for the um, reason that that I'm here, that I'm drawn to come and reason Sabbath school as well as uh, a renewal really of, of my Christian experience because um, 
I'm a fourth generation Adventist, as I know you are, and uh, many, many in this room would be as well. Uh, we, um, all of, all of those spiritual movements that came out of the middle 19th century, 1800s, okay, there's a great revival across America during that time, um, emphasized that, that the Lord was coming and we need to prepare for that. So, um, you know, the ad Part of the Adventist problem was that they focused so much on the, the prophecies that the other churches were thinking, you know, you don't even talk about the love of God anymore. And, and so why not, what, can't you just keep it simple and talk about the love of Jesus? And, okay, so yes, but we have this reason for thinking that we need to get ready for, for Christ's coming and um, so obviously we got to get somehow perfect. I want to drop back from saying all this to say that what I really appreciate about Tim is that he has a focus on helping the individual in a private and, um, and you know, secure way but he also has a burden for helping people within the corporate system, mm -hmm. which I think we all have been drawn into yeah. with the institution of the Adventist Church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he actually is standing and acting as a prophet, a reformer. Uh, you know, he's just like, it's like somebody pulled him out of the Middle Ages and here we are, you know. He's one of the he's one of those people in the line of uh, Luther and Zwingli and Calvin, all the rest of them, you know. And and so I feel like he deserves great appreciation for being willing to stand Amen. up and yes. act Amen. and speak to the problems that have kept us from that perfection yeah. that we thought we had to have mm -hmm. before Jesus came. So he's helping us mature, he's, and, and I think if people within the church will look at it that way, they'll get something from it. The um, interesting thing that, oh, about Jesus and Luther and Ellen White and Tim <laughs> is that where did their main problems, um, resistance, come from? The corporation. The church. The church. The church. The church. The church. So the lesson talks about Same how Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah. Jesus, yeah, that's right. true. Every one of them was an effort to uh, reform the church. Not an effort to leave the church, but an effort to reform the church. Right. And the church fought back. Kind of like draining the swamp. No, the swamp bites back, right? So in, in, most, in all these cases, the problem really stemmed from within the church who was not willing to see anything different. Even though God says uh, in the last days, people will, your young men, your old men, everybody, women, will see visions and dream dreams and have new light. Not that we'll substantially take away from the, the core belief of Scripture, but that we'll, I think of it as a gem, you know, you see it this way, and then you turn it, and you know, oh, look at that. That's even prettier, you know, and you just keep turning the truth around and see it from a different light. And I think that's what has drawn me to this Sabbath school class is we still believe the core beliefs, but we're seeing them through a different facet. Okay, and we, we, What's the different facet? What was the problem with the, the church uh, in the time that Christ walked the earth? What was the problem with the church in the time that... Luther and uh, Huss and Jerome and the, the great reformers walk the earth. What's the problem with the church right now in 2024? Anybody? Power-centric, power. ego, that kind of thing with the power Pharisees. And, and it's a misunderstanding of God's law yeah. and how it functions. Mm. Yeah. The, the, the Jews at the time of Christ thought that God's law was imposed. And, and not, not just imposed, it wasn't imposed enough. 
they took additional steps to impose more law, uh, more restrictions and more impositions because that's how God functions. So we have to function that way as well. If you worship a God that functions that way, you will become like him. It's it's law. And to, this this kind of comes around to answering the question of, from, from my from a personal perspective, is that the, the key, the linchpin that has made all all of this makes make sense over the last 15, 20 years is the, under, the coming to the understanding a few years ago, six, eight, maybe ten years ago, that God's law functions as design law. It does not function like the way humans uh, make up laws. And that, that fleshing out that difference has, has made, made all the difference. Many of the doctrines that I grew up with fall into place, make a lot more sense, yeah. uh, and New facet. unfortunately, mm-hmm. uh, I've had to relearn, uh, unlearn and relearn many of the principles and doctrines that I grew up admiring, but not knowing why, uh, but now they make far more sense. Yeah, so, yeah I, if, I feel exactly the same. Got, if anyone in here, anyone listening doesn't hasn't fleshed out that difference of yeah. uh, of the the distinction between design law and imposed law. Search our archives on the website. Search the blogs. There's plenty of information. There's plenty of data uh, that you can use to to delineate and make a distinction between. Yeah. Russell, don't you also find that, that it shifts it from that focus on the externals? Because all the, the extra laws that the Pharisees kept uh, uh, laying down was very focused on external behavior, not a state of the heart, versus the shift to the state of the heart and that, that heart transformation and heart relationship with God. Wanda, wanted but to say something. So much of the problem is we want somebody to tell us instead of studying for ourselves, mm-hmm. which is yeah. very important. Right. Like it's yeah. such a person to sit down yeah. with this word myself. And what, study what was that? Continue as <laughs> the much law of as worship. I possibly yeah. can. Yeah, exerting yeah. ourselves. Exactly. <clears throat> so we're running out of time here. I want to point out Isaiah 61, which uh, gave, it gave Christ his directions, his marching orders. And maybe ours. Let's look at it. In Isaiah 61, it says, um, preaching the good news to the poor was one of the things he was going to be doing. And binding up the brokenhearted, proclaiming freedom for captives, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. God is with you. I've been doing a little research on what is the year of the Lord's favor. And it really means God is with you. This is the year of the Lord's favor because God was actually with them back in those days, and he's with us now through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will take what's his and give it to us. Proclaiming a day of vengeance of our God. We have been talking about vengeance, about retribution and so on, and how God is so much better equipped at that than we are because he cares for their salvation, the people, our enemies, people that hurt us. He cares for them as he cares for us. (laughs) And... um, even though they don't deserve it, then we turn around and say, well, neither do I. You know, don't, don't judge because the judgment you make is going to be the judgment that is given to you because you do the same things. Amen. Maybe a little bit different thing, uh, take on that, but still the same thing. Comforting all who mourn, provide for those who grieve in Zion, bestow a crown of beauty, oil of gladness, and garment of praise. And we need to ask ourselves, are we a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor? Uh, we didn't get to a lot of the interesting things in here, but uh, I would say that in the talking about Satan and how he tries to trip us up, uh, just one little thing. I, I was reading um, a friend's Facebook entry this week who is used to be a Seventh Adventist, and they were so um, hateful about evangelical religious people, you know, that this was a ridiculous way of thinking and... Uh, you know, how, who was this God to try to be, make saving being arbitrary and so many misunderstandings uh, brought up in, you know, in her youth. She's what, about um, 72 or something. So she's, she's uh, wicked now. <laughs> but, you know, the, it just hurt my heart to think that 
she was exposed to the same thing we were exposed to, but she's found her comfort um, when, when, uh, when turning against the God that she was presented, she's turning against the God that causes all the problems. <laughs> you know, how tricky Satan is that he can slip right in there and say, like Russell said, I'm the light. You know, follow me. Uh, look at things in nature. Worship them. All these kind of tricky things that uh, will be just slipped right in next to what we used to believe or do believe that cast God in a bad light that causes people to, uh, like they'll say, well, so many things aren't the way they are in the Bible. People translate it wrong. They inserted men in a place. They inserted a comma when it said, today you will be with me in paradise. Without a, par without a comma, it would have been I saying to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Well, when he says, I'll do this for you and that for you, you say, well, will you die for me? <laughs> yeah. Well, and the thing is, though, when people lose their faith in the Bible then and they throw out the, babe, the, wash with the, I mean, the baby with the wash, the thing is that um, the stuff we really need to be saved is in the Bible. All the questions we have, somebody asked in the Bible. Go find them. Look at the questions people asked. Look at the answer Jesus and other people in the Bible gave. Because there's not one question we have that hasn't been asked in the, and answered in the Bible. And so I say that even with the, the problems with the translators and so on, their own biases, the crux of what we really need is there. We, we need to know, I mean, we know that God has made us. We know that God is good. We know he died to save us. We know that he's coming again to rescue us. And again, look at all the questions people ask. What's, what must I do to be saved is one that, that comes to my mind. But a lot of questions you'll see. Just I, I challenge you to go to your Bibles and look up questions that people asked and really pay attention to the answers because they'll answer yours too. But Linda, don't you think people, though, they have been hurt or abused, and so they turn to their pain, and they get angry, and they, then that anger mounts, and then that's what they build their life on, that anger yeah. of what has been done to them instead of letting go of that, like you talked about before. Or even and, loss can cause that same thing. You lose something, and right. you grieve so much over it. That's, right. That your exactly. event has has yeah. caused such a loss in your life, you can't move on because you're, right. you're focused on holding on to that, but you right. can't hold on against the, tor the, right. the torrential waters around you with one hand. You have to let go, or you won't be, you'll be washed away with that kind right. of bitterness and anger and grief. Right. You have to be willing to put that in the hands of God. Let him deal with the consequences of bad behavior and the restoration of hopefully the person who hurt you um, embrace life that's coming toward you instead of hanging on to the life that was. Because God intends for you good, and he brings good to you. Yeah. You just have to be open-handed, <laughs> not hold on to things, but have to be open-handed enough to take that, to take what he's bringing to you. Hold on to, the, to God. That's right. Well, we're over time a little bit, so let's have a little closing prayer. Dear Father, we know that Satan is a tricky guy, and he's been at this for so long very good at it very successful amazingly successful we pray that he is not successful in our lives or in our witness or you know help us to be so filled with light that that the darkness is repugnant to us that we wouldn't even think of doing harmful things to our relationship to our health to our our relationship with you to to anybody that that you would so much put your character of love in us, that love is all we have, that love is all we act out of, that will become like nature, second nature to us to be like you. We want that. We don't want Satan. We don't want to be deceived. We pray that you will keep us from being deceived and show us who you really are every single day in our path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.